COVID-19 has not stopped the climate emergency, but we have a chance to steer what comes next. This session will highlight stories of people creating change and explain how everyone can become part of the solution. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our session today. My name is Sarah Marshallden and I work for UN Climate Change. My work focuses on highlighting positive stories of climate action and climate action uh, through our UN Global Climate Action Awards. And today we're gonna speak to three people who are gonna give us some much needed inspiration on how the world is addressing climate change, even during these difficult times. So their work, our work has continued unabated during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in fact, the pandemic hasn't stopped the climate emergency. Quite on the contrary. So 2020 has brought us new record temperatures, it's brought us a heat wave in Siberia, and now it's brought us wildfires in Western United States. But it's not all bad news. There's a lot we can learn from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in fact, it's validated the approach that we need to take on climate change. And that approach is listen to the science, act early, and work together. So we've seen the value of that when it comes to COVID, and we know we need to apply that to climate change. And COVID has also shown us that we need to rebalance our relationship with nature. So today we'll hear from three inspiring speakers who are working on the solutions to get us there. Um, we have Joanna Sistento, who's a climate activist. We have Damon Gamau, who's an actor, director, writer, producer. And we have Gonzalo Munoz, who is one of our UN high level climate change champions. So I will start actually with Joanna. So you've been a climate activist for several years now, but you haven't always been a climate activist. And in fact, you have a very personal story that brought you to this point, um, mainly by surviving Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. So if you don't mind, if you could talk about your personal experience with the typhoon, um, how it affected you personally, as well as your home country of the Philippines, and how it, it evolved your, your, your relationship into becoming a climate activist. Um, well, uh, thanks, Sarah, for, for that question. Um, I'll try to keep uh, my answers sh as short as possible. <laughs> see the, the, the story of, of my experience is quite long, and um, it would take a long time for me to, to tell it. But anyway, um, so on November 8, 2013, it's almost seven years ago, actually, um, Super Typhoon Haiyan. Um, hit my hometown of Tacloban City here in the Philippines and thousands of people died and millions were displaced in just two hours. Um, we experienced storm surge as high as 15 to 20 feet and the intensity of the winds were so strong. It was the first time ever that we've experienced um, such such strength of, of a typhoon. Um, and as, as you know, like Phil the Philippines, we experience an average of 20 typhoons per year. So it's quite normal for us. But as I always say, Super Typhoon Haiyan was a totally different kind of monster. Um, um, during that day, I actually lost most of my family members. I lost my parents, my eldest brother, my sister-in-law, and my three-year-old nephew, leaving only me and my older brother as survivors. Um, and ever since, ever since that day, a lot has, like everything changed for all of us, not just for my family, but for, for our whole community. And it was actually that experience um, uh, that experience was such an eye-opener for all of us and, of course, to me. Um, as, as the years pass, um, I realized that the problems people had, even before the super typhoon happened, um, were uh, still existed during the aftermath and the years that followed. Mm -hmm. And all these problems are... Uh, uh, continues to be magnified every time we are hit with a catastrophe and now with the COVID-19 pandemic. 
it has revealed different layers of injustices and um it it really uh, the, these these kinds of 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 catastrophes of disasters um it 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 magnifies the inequalities um uh, i i mean in the, the social economic the social economic problems of 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 the community and, and the current broken systems um but of course as as i made a commitment to myself back then that you know this typhoon happened to us um i wouldn't i wouldn't allow it to be the end of my community story because we we wanted uh, i didn't want that my community would be continuously portrayed as victims as poster the poster child for typhoons mm -hmm. um because we're so much more than that and um we uh, we may have lost everything to the storm but we have gained a powerful story to tell and that story continues to humanize the abstract um concept of climate change it it puts a face to the science which i think is very important especially um especially because stories real stories from real people um are so much more relatable than the numbers and statistics of course science is very important but if we if we put if we combine stories with the facts um the stories show the heart and soul behind each statistic yeah absolutely i mean i'm sorry for your loss and it's an absolutely tragic and terrible moment that brought you into your climate activism but i think you're absolutely right and you've hit the nail on the head that oftentimes in these negotiations you know we we talk about uh, abstract concepts of emissions in the atmosphere and and like you said yes absolutely that's the science and that's absolutely important but the other thing the more important thing is how this affects people and and the fact that you're bringing those stories uh forward um is very commendable and so i think that's that's going to get us hopefully to the ambition that we need to really address climate change um and in fact i have another question for you uh, I know that uh, I was there. You walked all the way from Rome, Italy to Katowice, Poland to attend the UN Climate Change Conference um, a couple of years ago. And again, I've been involved in this process for quite some time. And I know that young people like yourself have had a very powerful voice and you've, you've had a very strong message on climate change. But after that conference, things really started to change. I think people really, really started to listen to young people. Um, and pay attention to what they were saying on climate action. And we then saw this explosion around the world of youth movements on climate change um, in support of climate action. So for you, uh, how did you experience the climate debate during that time that the youth voice uh, suddenly was being listened to? Um, and how did that momentum make you feel? Um... I remember uh, during that time when, when we arrived in Katowice, um, Poland, it was actually my first time to attend the climate march. Mm -hmm. And just being in that space and that energy with, with the youth all over the world. And um, it, it, was, it, it was actually a, a mix of, of so many cultures of different, um, different age groups. It was ex it was an exhilarating moment for me that um, it actually reminded me of 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 why uh, all of us are coming together um, to to surface problems to promote solutions mm -hmm. um, in response to the climate crisis and um, with this work it's actually a constant pendulum of hope and despair as I say. <laughs> And especially now that almost everything is accessible online, including news that frustrate you. <laughs> but what I see is that with every 
infuriating news that I read or watch, somehow the youth manage to channel their anger and frustrations to surface problems and act on it. Yeah. Um, we keep on talking about um, giving hope to each other, giving hope. We keep on talking about um, how hope is very valuable and it's true, but personally, hope is not enough because we need, we need action. After, after, we, after we feel hopeful, we need to channel it to something that's more concrete. And um, whenever I am, whenever I witness um, the youth coming together, you know, this growing global movement for climate, um, it reminds me why, it reminds me why I pursued the path of activism. Um, how belonging to a community is very significant if you are in this work. Because, you know, we can't do this alone. That's why we're all here today. You know, we, we tell stories and with, dif with different backgrounds and experiences. And just to be in that, just to be in that space with people um, with whom you share the same passion and mission, it, it, it's very telling of, of a future that's hopeful and at the same time um, working towards a better normal for all of us. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, as you said, hope, hope is so important. I mean, I think we all have to keep hope alive and feel that, you know, that it's not too late and that there is a window of opportunity to change things and to make things better. But without hope, you know, we do need the solutions, like you said, and we know those solutions exist. We know they're out there. Um, we have a documentary that we'll talk about in a, in a few moments that is full of solutions. Um, and I think actually this is a good transition to talk maybe now to Gonzalo a little bit. Um, you know, hope, momentum, um, getting everybody involved, uh, and action. And we know that 2020 is, you know, even with COVID, it's a crucial year for the Paris Agreement. And the reason why is under the Paris Agreement, every country has to submit a five-year plan that outlines how they're going to tackle climate change. These plans are still due in 2020. Um, but to achieve the Paris Agreement's goal of getting to, to limit 1.5 degrees of warming, um, we need more than action just by national governments. We need cities, we need businesses, we need investors, we need regions, we need civil society, we need young people, we need, you know, basically everybody needs to be on board. So um, Gonzalo, uh, who was nominated by the Chilean presidency and the, Net and the United Nations as one of our high level champions, um, his role is to mobilize climate action by what we call non-state actors. So um, basically like that long laundry list I just shared of basically everyone outside of national governments um, around the world. So Gonzalo, maybe just tell us about your role. Um, what is it to be a high level climate champion? Uh, tell us what you've been doing and tell us how you think these two groups, so countries and basically everybody else can best work together. Thank you so much, Sara, and great to be here. Johanna, I'm so sorry for your loss and I'm very touched by your uh, everything that you shared with us. Damon, it's an honor to be with you and thanks for the documentary. Um, let, me, let me refer to, to, to the Paris Agreement as the first moment when those non-state actors that you mentioned, Sara, were formally uh, integrated into the process or recognized as uh, the, those that can also deliver the action and the implementation is required to finally fulfill the Paris Agreement. Uh, so, so since Paris, we've had six high-level champions, France, Morocco, Fiji, Poland, Chile, and now UK. And, and I was for the first time named as high-level champion coming from the private sector. Uh, so as you said, our role is to mobilize, work 
hand by hand with the previous or, uh, or, or whatever you are in your first or your second year with the previous or your or, or, or the following one. So last year working with uh, Thomas Khrushchev from Poland and this year and now also next year working with Nigel Topping from the UK. Uh, part of my experience was not only to, uh, to, I mean, to follow the mandate on mobilizing non-state actors around climate action uh, as we understand it, but um, some things work quite differently uh, from my, in my case for, as I said, I was the first time uh, a, a high level climate action champion coming from the private sector with somehow a different narrative or a different uh, um, kind of idea of what are those uh, non-state actors capable of, of, uh, of uh, delivering, but mostly with a very clear mandate on positioning science in the center. And that was something very critical. So as, as, as you might all remember uh, that, that uh, time in Katowice when uh, Joanna joined uh, the, the march, uh, that those two weeks, uh, the parties also were discussing what to do to, with the 1.5 report that the IPCC launched in October 2018. In my case, uh, my presidency told me to follow that as an innegotiable. So part of my role was first to position the 1.5 degrees and the science in the center. That, that meant for me not only putting together the existing commitment, so based on science-based target initiatives, see what we can do in terms of canalizing all of that energy towards one common goal, but also position that internally in the Marrakesh partnership, the big platform that the, the high level champions have in order to show the parties and help the parties in terms of the actors, uh, the non-state actors uh, mobilizing um, climate action. Uh, we put, we asked the Marrakesh partners to also uh, deliver some concrete tools and, and documents around the 1.5 pathways. How, how that, that the world looks like, that, that the world that we are expecting to be able to, uh, to uh, develop. Uh, and, and, and in that sense, one of the things that we did not only internally in the, in the, in the Marrakesh partnership, but also worldwide, we said, okay, let's put together all of those non-state actors are already uh, mobilizing themselves and their stakeholders around a net zero and resilient world by 2050, the latest. So we created the Climate Ambition Alliance and we put it together, everybody that is mm -hmm. on one side committed to that uh, idea of net zero by 2050, but also following science. We put it together, the methodology and, and, and with the Climate Ambition Alliance, we launched a, the biggest coalition of uh, different actors, meaning, as you said, not only subnational regions, but also cities, businesses, and investors. We launched it just one year ago at, at the summit of the Secretary General, the Climate Summit in New York. And then we updated those numbers to COP25. And then we updated the numbers again uh, for, uh, for the Environmental Day last June. And we are now updating it this week uh, on the on the New York Climate Week, and uh, and the idea is to increase the climate community, all of them together towards the same goal, showing to the parties that there's so much that is already happening and so much capability of the non-state actors, in order to create and to activate the ambition loop, and that is something that is also well referred in the in the Paris Agreement. The idea is when the parties they sign an agreement like the Paris Agreement, then they send this message to the non-party stakeholders for them to start mobilizing. When these non-state actors, all of them, cities, uh, businesses, investors, we now incorporate universities. We're hoping to incorporate now schools. Uh, we're now hoping to incorporate, incorporate uh, sports initiatives. All of them can then show the parties that this is something that is happening. And in that sense, they will, through the ambition loop, help the parties for them to increase their ambition through the NDCs. That's what we're doing. We have done a lot uh, with, with last year until COP25, and now we're increasing uh, the number of actors uh, around a global campaign that is called Rate to Zero. 
Yes, I, it's funny you mentioned race to zero. So um, I was just going to ask you about that because we know that cities, businesses, regions, everybody um, is coming together to start what's being, we're, it's being called the race to zero. So what is the race to zero and what progress in the race to zero has been made so far? What is zero? What is the race to zero? We're going to get here. The race to zero is to, to really all of us work toward that uh, net zero resilient world that we require, as science is telling us, uh, before 2050. 2050 is the latest, latest year. So in some cases, we have non-state actors that are committed to, to do that today. Some of them are saying we're going to do it in this next decisive decade. Some of them are saying 2040. And, and some of them are saying I'm, I'm planning for reaching that hopefully no longer at 2050. That I would say is the, is the minimum of the commitments that we expect from all non-state actors of the world. And, and, I'm, and, and I'm saying this very hardly to all of them uh, worldwide, saying not committing to such a, an ethical and important and urgent task is also a message. What type of message are you sending to the world while not committing to that? So hopefully we will be able with now Nigel Topping through Race to Zero is the global campaign of the non-state actors that are part of the Climate Ambition Alliance. Um, as I said, we launched this Climate Ambition Alliance with uh, 217 members uh, last year at uh, UNGA. Then we increased that number to more than 1,200 members at COP. We updated the number uh, last uh, June uh, to more than 2,000 members. And this week we are increasing the numbers up to almost 2,200. But, the, but more than that is not only uh, the number of members and, and part of our commitment with Nigel is to increase that tenfold to COP26 at, at the minimum. So we, hopefully we can reach more than that. We're now launching the Climate Hub with uh, I, the International Chamber of Commerce in order to bring all SMEs of the world capable of joining with again, a common methodology based on science, but now that commitment that I'm expressing you represents more than, more than half of the global GDP and more than one third of the global population. That's wow. the size of the community that we have been capable of putting together in just one year. There's a lot mm -hmm. to be done in the following year towards COP26, but we expect that uh, it, it will be able to also reach massive audiences and citizens all around the world so it's not only about, as, as Joanna was mentioning, on March and expressing this concern and this personal commitment. That has to be connected also to everything that we do on a daily basis. Not only about voting, it's about our, our capability of purchasing and therefore rewarding certain practices and commitment from businesses. Living in a city that where you have a participation on being part of this, using your financial power, at the end also using your talent while in, like bringing this voice with your employees and, and the organization where you work. And at the end also using the, the power of, of love in terms of your relationship on how much we have to engage others. And, mm -hmm. and, and at, at the end, Race to Zero is the, this, this global campaign that expects to bring everybody on board and, and hopefully uh, we will have citizen sayings, I am part of Race to Zero with all of the commitments and all of the practices and, and, and all of my behavior in a daily basis. Well, that's really, really encouraging to hear that. I mean, it sounds, it's, it, you, we, I think we're bombarded with a lot of negative uh, news about climate change and rightly so. Um, but what we're not hearing um, are these these human stories like Joanna's stories or, or Gonzalo, your stories of bringing together all of these different actors together, making firm commitments um, to get us to zero net emissions. So uh, it's, it's very encouraging. And I think we need this kind of uh, these stories now more than ever. And that sort of brings me over to Damon Gamow. And Damon is a director, writer, producer, and presenter from Australia. And he most recently put together a documentary called 2040. And it's an aspirational journey to discover what the future could look like if we simply embrace the best solutions that already exist today. So the solutions are there. Uh, the solutions are happening. The solutions are already being in implemented. So there is reason to hope, you know. Um, and, and let me just uh, talk to, to turn it to Damon now. Um, your previous film talked about sugar and nutrition. So 
what made you um, or what inspired you to, to go from that to the topic of climate change? And interestingly, you used the film um, sort of framed as a letter to your young daughter. So, so what made you want to address climate change and why did you choose to frame it that way in, in, in a letter mm. to your daughter? Uh, well, thank you first for, for having me and uh, it's terrific to hear from the other speakers. I, uh, I was a parent. Uh, I had a three-year-old daughter at the time and uh, was concerned that I, I couldn't engage with climate change as a topic. I knew it was happening. I was aware it was happening, but I didn't know the entry point. I couldn't find a place that resonated for me. And I remember reading about um, one of the coral bleachings we had here at the Great Barrier Reef in 2016. And I was halfway through the article and then I turned the page and started reading a different article and stopped and thought, why couldn't I finish that article? Mm. I am a father with concerns about the planet and my daughter's future, but something psychologically stopped me from actually embracing that story. So I began to do some research and spoke to an environmental psychologist in the US. And she really explained that when we are only hearing stories that come with fear and anxiety and dread about the future, it does activate a part of our brain, the limbic system in our brain. And when that's activated, it shuts down the prefrontal cortex, which is where we problem solve and we think creatively. So it, when it came to climate, we we're only using those stories. So the more I started researching, talking to academics, looking for the solutions, I felt my own spirits lift. And suddenly I felt that more motivated, more engaged with the topic. So I thought there was a really big opportunity to um, tell a different story with climate and frame this moment as an opportunity and not tell a story of depravity and sacrifice and surrender, but actually tell a story of, of the possibilities that lie on the other side of this crisis and how we can improve our communities and our air and our quality of food and all living creatures. And that this is a, a profound moment for us as the human race um, and to try and get people excited by that. Um, and I guess framing it as a letter to my daughter comes back to, to Joanna's lovely point before that I think sometimes, and it's not the fault of scientists, but we've left all the communicating to scientists and they use a language, uh, anthropogenic, negative emissions. These don't stir the soul of people. We rely on, on the facts and the data and the logic to convince people, but really we're a species that's evolved to tell stories. We want to hear stories about these topics. And so I just wanted to personalise the story as much as I could. Uh, and so that idea of, of a letter to my daughter saying, yeah, I know things are tough. We understand that. But what I want you to know is that there are millions of people out there that care about your future. There are an extraordinary range of solutions that can turn this thing around. And if we just focus that spotlight away from, from the negative stories and start to focus on these wonderful people that are doing great things, we might actually pull this off. And I guess after spending four or five years with the film now, um, I can categorically say, as you've alluded to, that we can do this. And I couldn't say that five years ago. And I know the road ahead is going to be tricky, but I feel um, better as a parent that I'm armed with that arsenal to say to my daughter, yes, it's tough. Yes, it's going to be a challenge, but I can tell you, honey, we can pull this off. There are things we can do. And I think at a time where there is a nihilistic narrative emerging, it's important for everyone out there to know that we have everything we need in this moment to get through this. Uh, and I think storytelling is so important in this moment. I want more artists and poets and musicians, anyone to share this stuff, disseminate the science, get it out of that sort of that ivory tower language and permeate the culture with art. That's the power of art. And, and I hope more artists start to embrace this topic and spread the message far and wide. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, just looking back at how climate change has been communicated over the past 20 or 30 years, you could argue that it's been a very strongly negative narrative and, and, and perhaps that's because that's what makes news. I mean, news isn't full of positive stories of all the good things that are happening around the world. Today. Um, but it's been this overwhelmingly negative experience, this overwhelmingly negative narrative. And like you said, you're reading this article and you just, you couldn't get through it because it was, it was just mm -hmm. that part of the brain shuts off. So maybe if you could just elaborate on, on why, it's so important to shift toward a more positive narrative on mm. change, even though we know mm. impacts are very dire, very severe, um, and are getting worse. 
yeah, maybe just elaborate a little bit on where where this role of this positive narrative on climate mm. can, can be, why is it so important? Yeah, I think we've got to be careful there in the, in the sense that it, we don't exclusively focus on positive stories. That there is a balance that needs to happen. Um, and I just think that balance has been out. We've been very good at sounding the fire alarm, but if you're going to sound the fire alarm, you've got to show people where the exits are at the same mm -hmm. time. And we haven't done that. And when you're only sounding the alarm, people can panic and they go into paralysis and it's all too hard and they shove it away. So there needs to be a really lovely equilibrium between those two things. Um, and I think uh, as human beings, we, you know, hope is very powerful. It's the thing that gets us up every day. It's what motivates us. It gives us meaning in our lives. Um, but it needs to be, I think, with climate, a very grounded hope, a muscular hope. And in the film, I use this term fact-based dreaming. So everything I showed my daughter in the future in 2040 had to exist now in some form. I didn't want to make something up or invent a technology that might appear. It was sort of saying to her, honey, we could do it all now because all I'm doing is showing an extrapolation of these things that are occurring around the world. Um, Cause I think that's important. If I hadn't done that, it would have been probably an exercise in bad parenting. I wouldn't want to say to her, it's all going to be fine and utopian and Hey, you know, it's, it's unicorns and rainbows. I want her to know that it is going to be challenging and I need to, we need to teach our children resilience for what lies ahead. Um, but at the same time, and we certainly experienced that with the film, we've had a million children now have been taught our curriculum materials for 2040 and the feedback we get and the projects that these kids are doing and they're inventing seaweed hoodies and they're making small solar power, like they're just lit up by the creative process of give, being given solutions. And they're now excited about a future career that could have a role in restoring and regenerating the planet. So that's that's the power of storytelling and positive solutions is we inspire people by showing them what other humans are doing. And then they say, right, I want to do that in my community or I want to do that with my career. And, and, and that's that's why the positivity, I think, is so crucial in this moment. Yeah. And I just want to pick up on something you just said. And it is a key theme in your in your film 2040, this concept of fact based dreaming because this is the first time I've, I've heard of this concept what exactly is fact-based dreaming yeah well I, I think I mentioned it before it's just that making sure that when we are dreaming and obviously 2040 is a is a dreaming piece it's a it's a it's a, a vision of the future based on about 130 children I interviewed around the world and some other academics and scientists um, but of course it's you know it's only positing one potential future but I just wanted to make sure that it was grounded in some sort of reality um, mm -hmm. because there are so many different versions of the future we could run with. But I just wanted to make sure that that future contained things that existed now. So whether that was, you know, solar glass on the buildings that I show in the future, well, that is already being developed in Oxford. Or whether it was showing, you know, regenerative farming practices and, and in integrated agroforestry and perennial trees and vegetables, they're already being grown now in different parts of the world here's what it would look like at scale. Here's the impacts on food and soil health and animals and our own health uh, if, we, if we widen and implemented that across the globe. So that was really the idea, was to take all these beautiful seeds that are around the world right now and watch them in full blossom by 2040. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, this, is, this is fantastic. Um, and in my own role at UN Climate Change, uh, awarding uh, the best of the best climate solutions that are out there around the world. Um, these solutions exist and there they, there's absolutely no reason we can't have fact-based dreaming. Uh, I, I really like that concept because we have a vision, but we've already got the solutions to get us to that vision. Um, and maybe that brings yeah. me over to Joanna again, if you don't mind. This, this positive vision um, that Damon is, is talking about, um, you know, in terms of our negotiations and the Paris Agreement, um, and Joanna, someone who has experienced climate change in a very tragic and horrible way, what would it mean for you um, if, if um, the vision of the Paris Agreement would become a reality? Mm. Well, the, the inaction did not only affect my family and my community. Um, but it has left billions of people from all over the world suffering for several years now. That's undeniable. So to see the vision of the Paris Agreement come into reality is actually um, tantamount to reclaiming our basic human right to a safe, 
decent and dignified life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, absolutely. Um, and maybe I turn over to Gonzalo um, on fa fact-based dreaming um, and what you've seen in your work um, with all of the non-state non actors. Uh, we do we do you see the solutions um, that can get us to zero carbon? Um, you know, among these sectors, businesses and cities, do you see this fact-based dreaming in your role as a climate champion? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the 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 best way to explain that is that if you analyze all of the technology that is being deployed to potentially uh, live in Mars, we have it. We can live sustainably in Mars. And we're not living sustainably in the earth, so that that's part of the stupidity of the human species. <laughs> but uh, but as Damon is saying, uh, there the the technology is there, the capability is there, even the narrative is there. If you see how uh, not only the renewable energy has increased uh, in these years, electric vehicles, uh, even even during these COVID times, we have seen how energy efficiency and retrofitting buildings has become the best solution for implementing in a fast way jobs and, 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 and economic activity that is also contributing to reducing the local emissions and reducing the greenhouse emissions uh, globally. We have seen how veganism has become the major change in, uh, in, 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 in food uh, 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 habits around the world in, in forever. Uh, we have seen how, um, the, the, this, this month's uh, green hydrogen has started to ramp up as, a, as another expression of how we have not only the capability, but also the urgency on phasing out of coal. We have seen how the financial sector has the tools set out around uh, ESG metrics that are not only the needed in terms of environmental and social, but it's also the smartest way to understand the role of finance. So all of those tools and many others are properly uh, and, 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 and brilliantly expressed in, in, in Damon's documentary are there. We just have to use it. And we have to use even this particular moment where we're not only about uh, uh, speaking on, uh, on building back better, Building back better and sometimes you surely means stopping things uh, that, that has harmed us and starting new ones. But in so many cases, just been accelerated changes that are there and have been there for so long. Okay, I'm going to throw a challenge out to each of you, to all three of you. I think we're all on the same page here. It sounds like we're, we're all in agreement here. I think we all agree that we have the vision. We all agree that the solutions are already out there. So to each one of you, what is missing? What is missing to achieve this? Um, and I'll, I'll start with Joanna. What, what's missing? Um, to me, what's missing is not something, um, it's not some, the answer to this is not something concrete. To me, what's missing is empathy, political will, and, the humility of leaders, of powerful corporations and communities to accept and understand that the earth, our environment, is not a commodity. It's home. Yeah. It's a different kind of uh, education, isn't it? Or a different way of, or, or the real way of seeing the world. I mean, we, we don't exist without air, water, food. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I disagree with you. You said it's not concrete. I think it, what your answer was actually very concrete. Um, yeah. Damon, how about you? What, what's missing? What do we need? Yeah, it's a complex question. I mean, there's so many things I would say, um, it's particularly pertinent for me in my country right now, but it's, uh, we have a huge problem with the politics and the democracy. We have such a polluted, um, environment in terms of, um, the amount of lobbyists that uh, from the fossil fuel sector, from the mining sector, that play a role in our parliament here um, and our media too. We have one of the most concentrated media landscapes in the world. Uh, the owners of all that media have links to extractive industries. So they are the gatekeepers of a narrative and they are telling a story uh, that is misleading the majority of our population. So even as we look to post COVID, we are uh, not looking to renewables, which we should be because we have more sun and wind than anywhere in the world we are talking about a gas-led recovery. 
uh, and building more pipelines and digging more and fracking more in, in the ground, which is just absurd uh, for where we are. So that's a barrier, particularly in, in my country. But I would say on a larger issue, I think we all know here that um, climate change isn't just, it's a symptom. And, and it's a symptom of an underlying architectural problem of our, of our system. And that is that we largely base our model, the architecture is based on extraction and domination where we really need to shift to a more interconnected and regenerative system and incentivize those behaviors instead of rewarding people that are very good at dominating, uh, treading on others, showing no empathy, as Joanna said. Mm. We give those people positions of power. They get, then get to set the rules of the game. So we are largely a group of altruistic people that want change and care about the world, but we've set up a system where we're governed by largely small groups of psychopathic or sociopathic individuals um, that don't really care for the rest of us. And that is a huge problem. And traditionally, we didn't do that. You look back to hunter-gatherer tribes, they ostracised that person if they showed those tendencies of sociopathy. They were ridiculed because they knew that would destabilise the harmony of their tribe, whereas we make them the leaders of countries. We make them CEOs. So unless we address that, that core functionality of how we operate, we're not going to get through that. And that might take a while to transition to, and we don't have to do it straight away. But I think that is at its depth, a, a major issue of why we're having climate change and all sorts of other ecological problems. Yeah. And like you said, it's, it's complex, isn't it? That's, that's <laughs> not an easy one, but uh, yeah. And Gonzalo, how about you? What do we need to achieve this? It's missing. Um, I, I would like to, to, to refer also about the learnings uh, from this uh, pandemic that we're going through. Mm -hmm. and, and you see which have been like the main failures in terms of leadership on how to uh, confront the, the pandemic. There has been probably three major elements. And, and, and I like that Joanna just mentioned one of them. The first one is incapacity of understanding science. Okay, that's, that's the first one. The second one is lack of empathy. And the third one is incapacity of collaborating with others. And it's also related to what mm -hmm. Damon just, just mentioned. Uh, th those elements should allow us to understand also how, how the three of them are absolutely required to uh, confront the climate crisis. And, uh, and, and with Nigel topping, we are now trying to, under, to, try to analyze uh, more than 10 uh, sectors in the economy that are, are there uh, in the situation where they might require a, a, a specific uh, extra energy in order to accelerate the transition. So we are developing now the, the system transformation maps in more than 10 sectors of the economy. But let me uh, refer to three of them that, that I consider that probably are the ones in which we can accelerate in a, in a, in a very concrete way. Uh, Johan Rostrom always says that uh, in order to solve climate crisis, you, the, 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 the solution is in three F. It's about fuel, it's about food, and, it's about, and the rest are footnotes. Uh, uh, I have said this to, to, to Johan, I would incorporate an, an extra F. So I would say, yes, it's fuel, it's energy. We have to change that dramatically and the, the opportunities are there. It's about food, it's about how do we relate with nature, how do we understand nature as a repository of the assets that sustain life and not as a place where we just go there and extract materials. The third F for me is finance. How do we use the power mm. of money to put the right mm. incentives and to mobilize our real capacity of transformation in a positive way? And the rest are footnotes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the session. I mean, I could keep talking to each of you probably for another hour or so, um, but unfortunately we have to end the session. So I. I want to thank you not only for your time today, but for the work that each of the three of you are doing. Um, I'm feeling more motivated and invigorated just by listening to the three of you. And it makes me realize that there is so much going on and there is so much positive momentum. And we can change. We can. We absolutely can. You know, we've, we've put people on the moon. We've built the Berlin Wall and torn it down. Why can't we address this? You know, we, we're, we're addressing COVID, you know, like you said, Gonzalo, bringing that, that together to tie that in with climate change. We can mobilize, we can do this. Um, and I feel hopeful and, and optimistic that we can and we will. I don't think there's any other choice that we have other than to be hopeful. Um, so I wanna say thank you again for participating and for your work in general. And we're here to work with you so that we have a healthy, clean, green, sustainable, better future. 
Um, yeah, so thank you so much for today and for, for everything. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Stay well. Thank you.